good evening and welcome everyone to our round table on the topic Russian historical memory today. Uh, my name is Ephraim Padoxik. I'm from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And I would like first to introduce the participants of our panel today. So, um, our first participant is Professor Alexander Atkins, who is at the moment um, Mikhail Bakhtin Professor in the Department of History and Civilization of European Univ uh, University Institute at Florence. And previously, he uh, held position of Professor of Russian Literature and Cultural History in the Department of Slavonic Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Professor Etkind is indeed an expert in the topic that we are going to talk about today. He, one of his research projects was Memory at War, Cultural Dynamics in Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. And he's an author of uh, many books and articles. And uh, in, in the context of our discussion, I would like to emphasize the book Memory in um, War of uh, Warped Morning, Story of the Undead in the Land of the Unburied, uh, Internal Colonization, Russia's Imperial Experience, and the edited volume Memory and Theory in Eastern Europe. Of the numerous articles that I saw here in CV, I'm most interested as someone who teaches this semester the course on Red Terror, uh, the article called Fear of the Past, Post-Soviet Culture and uh, the Soviet Terror. Um, uh, second participant is Dr. Itzhar Grudny, my colleague from the Department of Political Science and History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And he's a specialist in uh, Russian nationalism, uh, identity in, the, um, in Russia and post-Soviet uh, space. He is also of reinventing Russia, Russian nationalism and the Soviet state from 53 to 91, published by Harvard University Press. And as far as it stands, uh, he's now working on two manuscripts. One is the book, Politics of Nostalgia in Post-Communist Societies, uh, to be completed in 2020. And the other work is the Hegelian temptation, Hegel in Russian social and historical thought from 1840s to 1860s. Um, Dr. Vera Kaplan is our guest from Tel Aviv University, and she works in the fields of cultural and social history and history of education in Russia. Uh, he, uh, she um, co-edited two volumes entitled The Teaching of History in Contemporary Russia, Trends and Perspectives, and Educational Reform in Post-Soviet Russia. And he recently published a book called uh, Historians and Historical Societies <laughs> in the Public Life of Imperial Russia. Um, she's also uh, the author of many other uh, scholarly articles. And Dr. Pavel Vasiliev, who is a, a <coughs> Polonsky fellow here at uh, Va Vanley Jerusalem Institute. And he holds a PhD from Russian Academy of Science in History and a May from Central European University, which was then situated as far as I stand in Budapest. Yeah, and he's an, uh, uh, he's an historian who speci specializes in uh, justice uh, in post-revolutionary Russia and also uh, has made some studies on the topics of uh, uh, gender, body, and drugs. And, yeah, uh, and so uh, he's working on two manuscripts. Uh, one will be called Revolutionary Law and Revolutionary Feeling, Emotions, Crime, and Administration of Justice in Early Soviet Petrograd. And the other is called uh, Drugs and the Modern Russian City, Cocaine and Opiates in Petrograd, Leningrad, 1914-1939. So thank you all for coming to this uh, panel. 
So um, it's not going to be a boring academic event. We have a kind of discussion, a uh, round table, we'll exchange opinion, maybe we'll disagree or agree with each other, we'll see what, uh, what's going on. And um, the, uh, our topic is basically what is going on today with Russian historical memory and a Russian historical identity. And before I pass the floor to, to the participants, I will um, posit a few questions here. So one is that, at, at least as it seems to me, the, during the last 20 years, there was an attempt by the authorities, by the government, to, uh, to create, to build a certain narrative of Russian historical memory, uh, which it tried kind of to make sort of consensual. And at least in early uh, Putin years, we have this kind of very strange narrative of history or imperial history with no bad guys. Everyone was good. The whites were good. Reds were good. It was a heroic attempt to create memory, uh, a common memory for the history full of cleavages, uh, uh, violence, and mutual hatred. And what it seems to me that at the moment, we've uh, arrived to the uh, point where this kind of st structure no longer works. There is at least a feeling that the authorities move more and more towards rehabilitating specifically Soviet past. Whereas the society moves to forming its identity uh, on the basis of ancient and pre-Soviet past. And the, um, I think the sign uh, of this development was uh, um, this recent campaign about renaming uh, airports or naming airports for all major Russian uh, uh, cities. Because when you look at the list of the people who were then selected or voted for, we find mostly, quite unusually, a lot of figures from the uh, Russian, old ancient Russian and pre-Soviet periods, including the Princess Olga in Pskov. And uh, I think uh, the most symbolic fight was in the city, which is called now Kaliningrad, where the uh, audience was presented basically with three options, which symbolize three different paths of identity, of three different forms of memory. One was Kant. What did it symbolize? Did, was it a kind of uh, attempt to reintegrate imperial identity into kind of cosmopolitan, benevolent way to make Europe part of this identity? But, uh, but this was rejected, and there were two other options, uh, two exclusive uh, imperial options. One of the Russian Marshal Vasilevsky, a kind of continu continuity from the Soviet identity, and the other um, Elizabeth, the, uh, the Empress Elizabeth from 18th century, and in the end, um, Elizabeth I. So my first question would be to Professor Etkind is, OK, so what is Russia? What past is envisioned for Russia for the, for the government authorities, the establishment in Russia? Which Russia do they have in mind? And what is Russia historically taken, taken for the populace? Do they agree? Do they, uh, is it the same or not? What would they say? Well, thank you very much, Ephraim, for organizing this panel and uh, uh, collecting us here around this table and uh, asking this you know, b very big question, which I, I, will I will try to narrow, maybe even, or maybe broaden even, even further on. Um, so what does Russia I really don't know? Uh, I don't know it better than anybody else. But uh, I... Uh, you know, just following the events in Russia professionally and also as a Russian citizen, I, uh, I have developed a kind of uh, a strong understanding of uh, of the uh, of the uh, intentions uh, and anxieties of the Russian elite. The elite, the elite is a very deceiving term. So, uh, but uh, the elite, of course, is. Uh, um, consists of uh, 
those people who became rich and very, very rich during the last uh, 20 uh, um, or 30 years. Uh, some of them have a very direct connection to the governmental structures. Some of them uh, enjoy their leisure time, you know, and the capital that they have earned due to the help of these administrative structures earlier. Um, so, and they, I think the, these 100 or maybe 1,000 families, they actually define what's going on. Think about these airports, for instance, you know. Uh, it's a strange idea to rename all the airports, I think that's like more than 20 airports, just at once. Uh, I mean, the airports, Ben Gurion, you know, Ronald Reagan Airport, they, they, they were named in a kind of organic way. They were built, you know, they were named, or they, sometimes they were renamed. This idea of rena total renaming, definitely it's like an administrative project, isn't it? What about Kant? Um, I actually worked uh, on um, Kant as the Russian subject in Königsberg during the occupation of Königsberg, during the Seven Years' War of the 18th century. So for about four or five years, Kant was a Russian subject. I published uh, you know, uh, several essays on that. And that's a very interesting, uh, kind of deep, I think, uh, story uh, that, of course, I invite you to to read about. Nothing like that was mentioned during the current de debates about you know, whether to rename the airport in Kaliningrad after Kant or after an obscure but important um, general of the Red Army that reoccupied um, Kaliningrad uh, in the end of the World War II, or to rename it as it, it seems to be done after the Empress Elizabeth, who occupied Königsberg for the first time. Okay, Kant was rejected, but actually there is a, the, the University of Kaliningrad, it's called the Baltic University, named after Immanuel Kant. So the university is there, and you know, I, I love Kant, probably many of you do as well, and we agree that the university is a more proper, more proper, uh, pro more proper object, you know, to be named after Kant than uh, the airport. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get back to, the, to my understanding of these 1,000 families. So to me, that's a group fighting for recognition. There is a deep, deeply grounded philosophy of recognition. It comes from Hegel, Rukozhev. To Nancy Fraser, you know, feminist philosopher in the New School for Social Research in New York, who juxtaposed recognition and redistribution as kind of two basic vectors of social development Re recognition and redistribution, recognition of particular minorities, such as whatever, as particular, you know, fourth gender, uh, you know, so a particular combination in, Amer in the American context of race and gender and maybe a social status. So I propose to see the Russian elite in this perspective. That's a very tiny group with very special interests, of very special nature in fact, with very deep, uh, highly unusual history. One would say that, or I, I would say actually, that, that this are one of the most successful minority groups that we've seen in the modern era. Uh, but they have not accomplished their task. Their task is exactly recognition. So they must huge uh, wealth. They basically, they are done with distributing this wealth among themselves. Um, but they are, as a very Kind of well, as experienced, also very cynical people, they understand pretty well that uh, this amounts of wealth they need very special kind of protection. And this protection is, you know, uh, it would be done by professionals who know how to shoot and fight, and also it should be done by professionals who know how to argue and fight. So this course of protection is hugely important part of the task. 
I don't mean that there is any kind of spe specific conspiracy. Oh, it's not uh, like that. I, I, I imagine it more like an instinct. So just, f I, I see and that if, I, the, if no, I'm... Who are yeah. these people, like specifically, who is there, who is not there? You mean the uh, the thousand richest people or...? Yeah, you can... Thousand richest families, for instance. I mean, but uh, they, the overlap between the richest and the most powerful is huge, if not absolute. Uh, I mean, I, we know many names, we don't know all the names, but I, I think we, I mean, we will not go to the names. Um, recognition, recognition among whom? So there are two, uh, um, two dimensions. Uh, for international recognition and internal recognition. So this wealth should be, in order to be protected, or even developed, even though I, I think development is not the issue. The issue is protection of what is there. Not increase, just, you know, status quo. So in order to be protected, this wealth and, and property rights, in, in fact, they should be internationally recognized. That's an enormously difficult task. Uh, but these people take it creatively. And many of the events that we have observed, like, you know, just... Uh, reading, new, reading the newspapers during the last two years, I would put it into this context. On the other hand, even, so, so this task is not accomplished. Actually, it's far from being uh, done. Another task is internal recognition. That the Russian people, um, you know, who is, who are famously tolerant and accept all accepting and tamed and what, whatever you know historical stereotypes are connected to them. Sometimes they are eager to do you know right rebellion or if they succeed that is called revolution. And uh, this uh, threat of the internal revolution, in fact, is I think increasingly uh, important in uh, the Russian public sphere and also internal fears of, uh, of the elite. So international recognition, one task, internal or discursive self-affirmation and recognition, another task. Uh, they partially overlap and interact. In many ways, they are independent. And the debates about historical memory are just an improvised outlet a kind of one of the many branches of this fight for recognition. So what kind of historical memory are they interested to create? What, what will help them to reach this recognition? Yeah, so as Ephraim told you, and I agree with that, uh, there are basically two, two types of connection, uh, two types of anchoring the present in the past. One type is Soviet and another type is imperial. And they, have diff they are different. They, they could be in some, way, in some ways artificially connected. That's difficult to connect them, actually. Um, they could be taken uh, as two alternatives. And this project, like, like is, it, is it the both? Is it one of them? Which one of them? That basically, that's the kind of the, 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 the general scheme that we are operating with. I can talk much more about that, but probably yeah, we'll can, we'll uh, return to this. Continue with that. Uh, and thank you very much for that. And uh, <coughs> building on what you said, which is I want to uh, ask Pavel, uh, uh, the threat of the revolution. It's very interesting. Uh, interesting. A year ago, the, there was t uh, 100 years from uh, February and Bolshevik revolution. And thus, notice that in Russia, there is what not much about. So actually, there were two serials on the TV, both very, very critical about the revolution in 1917 as an action of foreign agent, one about Powers, the other about Trotsky. Um, on the other hand, uh, the current regime actually um, uh, wants to uh, downplay any criticism of the Soviet regime that this revolution uh, has uh, created. So um, how, how is you, as a historian of the events, after the revolution, how is the revolution seen today 
in Russia, again, by establishment and by the people? Right, that's, that's a great question. And uh, I think it was a major surprise last year um, because lots of people were really expecting something on behalf of the Russian government, uh, perhaps the Russian academia, the Russian society. Nothing really happened. Very few things that commemorated the 1917 revolution or revolutions. We might remember that there were two of them and did a whole lot of turbulent events during that year. There was very little official commemoration, especially if we contrast this with 1914, the anniversary of the First World War. And there were lots of projects launched by the Russian government, also increasingly by the Russian Orthodox Church, to commemorate the centenary of the First World War, or the Great War, as they now came to you know, uh, name it and uh, embrace this uh, Western title. Um, there is very little about 1917, and in fact, it seems that the Russian government really preferred to forget about this anniversary. It's not really uh, a good, uh, you know, it's not good timing. 2017, not a good timing, uh, especially since, you know, opposition politicians such as Alexei Navalny increasingly employ street uh, tactics and uh, they get the momentum, they um, enlist lots of young supporters who are ready to go to the streets, protest violently uh, in some cases, who are ready to you know, serve some time in jail. And uh, um, this is in, indeed not a very good uh, year to commemorate uh, what was indeed one of the major revolutionary outbursts in Russian history and uh, arguably also a very important event in the uh, history of the early 20th century. So. I think that uh, this year it's now a great relief for the Russian government that uh, they don't have to commemorate anything anymore. Oh, you know, there were some attempts to uh, talk about the civil war, I think also not very successful. And uh, generally speaking, I think I tend to disagree a little bit with the frame because of what you said that uh, you might come up with a scheme where the Russian society, so to say, prefers the imperial version of Russian history, while the Russian government or those thousand uh, richest families, which more or less overlap with the most powerful ones, completely agree with that, um, tend to prefer the Soviet version. I, I don't think that's really the case. And uh, I think that uh, there is some sort of selective mechanism at play, that there are certain events from both imperial and Soviet past, arguably even pre-imperial, if we talk about Princess Olga and stuff, uh, that serve the contemporary narrative well. And uh, I don't think that there is a major change uh, happening recently that uh, I don't think that the Russian government is abandoning in all imperial or pre-Soviet past. Uh, in fact, uh, when we talk about early Soviet period, I think there was very little that uh, contemporary Russian government, uh, Putin personally wants to commemorate Maybe the you know, Chikaz, the secret police and its glorious history, its early days, Putin himself being a KGB, a secret police officer in the past, perhaps a uh, little bit playing with that. But apart from this glorious or um, very problematic past, depends how you see it, um, there is very little that is being brought. And uh, when it is, it is most likely in a negative way, as you mentioned with uh, this TV series and so on. There is a lot which is instrumentalized from roughly 1940s onwards. And in this, you know, the contemporary Russian government is simply building on the uh, uh, foundational myths of late Soviet society, with the idea of the Great Patriotic War and uh, the unity of Soviet people in that war attempt. And this is something, you know, along with some of the elements of the Soviet welfare state that the Russian government still plays with and uh, employs sometimes very you know, strategically uh, and we, as we can see from the recent uh, attempt to introduce uh, um, pension reform and uh, the protests that uh, this received from the Russian population, and many opposition politicians, uh, that Russian people really do believe in a Soviet or post-Soviet welfare state, and uh, they hold uh, the government uh, responsible for providing them with, with social security and pensions and so on. Yeah, we were talking about these opposition groups and young people in right. Navalny, and uh, the uh, the government wants uh, people to see them as 
as dangerous as those uh, 1917 revolutionaries. And I wonder, you you study this period, 1917, 18, uh, 19. Is there any interest among young people actually in this period precisely because they're non-conformist? Oh, that's a good point. Um, I don't know because I'm not really a part of the Alexei Navalny's movement. And you know, I try to follow the news and... Uh, uh, I think he he does come up with a very interesting new sort of street politics and also a new way of communicating his message, particularly over YouTube, which is, as far as I understand, quite popular among younger Russians. Uh, also quite accessible. Uh, he's also he's also on Telegram. He he you know I think he likes Twitter most of all, but uh, he really knows that he needs to engage with the new uh, forms of technology. Uh, whether there was any serious uh, interest uh, in 1917, I'm, I'm not sure. Also, I don't think that the tactics that worked in 1917 are the tactics that are going to bring the revolution today. So in this sense, uh, you know, if I am in position to give advice to Alexei Navalny, if he wants to uh, organize a revolution, uh, he should probably look at different examples, not at 1917, perhaps at the uh, revolutions that happened over the last uh, 15 years uh, in a number of post-Soviet countries, but those are also very different settings from Russia, so not totally applicable. Um, and I think he's, he's, you know, he's careful enough to not talk uh, about these delicate uh, events, topics in Russian history. He knows that he can alienate lots of voters uh, by saying something about the Soviet period, maybe also about the imperial period. I think that in his speeches, uh, it's not really what it's all about. So it's really balancing, it's a balancing act. Perhaps for him even not really saying that much. So it's it's not, I, I, I don't think that this is the kind of the historical vision. I don't think that's the strongest part of his platform. Thank you very much. And much of the historical memory, how is history, national history is perceived by the people uh, depends on what is actually taught, on what is not taught in schools. And I want uh, then to ask the next question to, our, uh, uh, to Vera Kaplan about uh, how is now history, Russian and Soviet uh, history taught in school or, ha or has been taught for the last 30 years because there was a chaos there, there were a lot of fights. Where, where, where do things stand now? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, uh, actually, I think that when we are talking about the teaching of history, the now uh, has started from the uh, late 80s. And actually, if we are looking at this long period, the real crisis in the teaching of history actually was in 1988, when the matriculation exam in history was just cancelled. Because it was said, it was said in the main newspaper, Gorbachev related to this issue, that even the best teachers actually lied to their pupils in the school. And it was regarded as absolutely impossible to examine uh, young uh, citizens of Soviet Union still on the basis of uh, uh, such a program. And if we look at the attempts to rewrite the teaching of, uh, to rewrite, first of all, the school textbooks, in the beginning, it was a very clear attempt uh, to get rid, not of the Soviet history, but of the socialist history. And actually, socialism was the problem, not the Soviet period. And uh, but socialism is very complicated uh, notion. And if we look at this from the perspective of Begriffsgeschichte, I'm not sure that I pronounce it right in German, but actually the history of concepts, Reinhard Kozelek, one of the leading figures in the, this history of concept, uh, claimed that socialism as liberalism as fascism as uh, other uh, modern uh, notions uh, have very specific <coughs> semantic structure, which means more uh, promise, more expectation, less experience. And uh, according to uh, his perspective, he even, uh, he wrote about it, I just want to quote him, that actually until, in, in current period, we talked about it in the uh, 60s and uh, 70s, that actually 
all these uh, concepts are open uh, for interpretation uh, because their orientation to the horizon of expectation, not to the sphere of experience. But he claimed, if corresponding political design were realized, then once generated by a revolution, the old expectations work themselves out on the basis of new experience. This is true for republicanism, democracy, and liberalism. Presumably, this will also be true for socialism and for communism as well, if its arrival is ever announced. Of course, he couldn't expect it that once actually the complete disaster of socialism and communism will be announced. And in this period, the structure of this concept changed. Actually, socialism, socialism became the, the thing of the past. And the writing of textbooks from this perspective, it was very important to explain why it was necessary, how it started. And actually, uh, history textbooks of early 90s included very important term of alternative history. Actually, it was not uh, closed only for history textbooks. It's, it was rather popular in this period, alternative history. Where the development of history would be different. And it was very interesting textbook of uh, Igor Ionov, Moscow historian, who wrote a book of Russian civilization. Then he actually mentioned three points uh, in Russian history. Then its development could be absolutely different. And uh, in this period, I think the attempt was just to, you know, to, to forget it come it's possible about the socialist period, or just to explain that it was not real socialism, but actually revolution was anti-bourgeois. It was not socialist. But when people talked about socialism, actually they meant something very different, things. Uh, and it was a textbook of Igor Dalutsky, who which actually was written in a dialogic uh, format. And he discussed and he approached to potential pupils in an attempt just to, to make them think about it. Uh, the situation changed in, uh, in the beginning of the 21th century. And actually, it was a very clear point. Then Putin said that the largest tragedy of the uh, 20th century was the destruction of the Soviet Union. From this period, it was like, you know, it was like permitted to talk about the socialist period as another period. But I absolutely agree with Pavel that actually nobody mentions socialism, so it's very selective. Nobody talks about uh, uh, 20s as a period of choice, as a period of opportunities. The main event of the Soviet history is the Great Patriotic War and solidarity and, uh, you know, common experience of how to stand against the same enemy. So now we can uh, talk about attempt just to include the Soviet period, not as a socialist period, just in another period in the history of Russian civilization. If I just may... Uh... Ask if I understand this correctly. Okay. If I understand this correctly, uh, would it be correct to say that if uh, we, uh, we consider a discussion in the 90s in history books, we have socialism without Soviet Union, and in the 21st century we have Soviet Union without socialism? Would that formula... Uh, uh, no, actually, in the 90s it was an attempt to, to see the Soviet period as a period of mistake. Then uh, the wrong experience was uh, wrong experience was uh, attempt just socialism as a as an experiment which is supposed to be just you know finished. Uh, but was socialism a good thing or bad thing or unclear thing? <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, an attempt was to explain that probably the theory of socialism was not that bad thing. But uh, this theory, this idea, then it was uh, put in the Russian cultural context, was definitely not successful, uh, and was a different explanation why uh, Marxist idea and Russian historical tradition just, uh, uh, the result was a totalitarianism. Uh, but now I think uh, all the terminology is different, but the perception of time is the same, that actually, uh, there is no future, 
There is no brilliant future to sacrifice for it, to go to it. All the perception of history is rather cyclical, and uh, it explains a lot of things. Could you say that? Uh, could we say that Russian citizens now have no utopia and don't believe any utopia? There is uh, an anti-utopian uh, uh, sentiment. No, they have an utopia, which actually we have a golden age, which was in the Soviet period. It was in the past. It, it is not in the future anymore. So it's more about nostalgia in this sense. Yes. So, and this uh, uh, brings me to our fourth participant, Dr. Brudny, who is actually doing some research on nostalgia in Russia today. And we hear a lot in the news and surveys that uh, Russians are nostalgic about communism or socialism or Soviet past or whatever. So how right is this perception? Um. And to start about nostalgia, it's, I want to begin with a, with a PBS, American Public Television series about New York, in which Mayor Koch talks about his re-election campaign, and he talks about visiting a Jewish retirement home, where old lady tells him, Mr. Mayor, make New York the way it was, to which Koch answers, it never was the way it was, but I would try. Uh, and this is what nostalgia is about. It never was the way it was, but we would like it. So uh, to those who don't know, it actually started in the 18th century as a mental disease. And it was a mental disease in American uh, medical corps till the 1960s. It was a form of disease you can cure with a relaxation and a lot of family visits. It was, uh, nobody would argue today. Uh, but talking about history, why historical periods in which nostalgia is a very powerful force. In 19th century France, nostalgia for Napoleon. In the 20s and 30s Central Europe, nostalgia for Habsburgs. The great Franz Josef was a major political force. In Weimar Germany, the nostalgia for uh, Wilhelm in Germany for the First Reich. It was a very strong and political force which, which conservatives used as a political force. When the Soviet Union of the 1960s and 70s, Stalin was uh, definitely uh, uh, a nostalgic figure and was even one sort of a Stalinist poet once wrote a poem that said, Verniti Stalin on a pedestal, narodu nužen ideal. We want to bring Stalin back to the pedestal where people need an ideal. And there's a lot of, there's no, there's no service in the Soviet Union in the 1970s. Uh, Six and seventies and until the late eighties, but there was a lot of reports about pictures of Stalin with cab drivers and uh, bus drivers and everything else. So there was a nostalgia. However, it wasn't clear what was nostalgia for. And this is a question: what people are, what they want. You know, when they say, and I will start with a survey, a survey which a Russian public opinion agency called, now called Levada Ru, which does the survey since the early 90s, we're asking the questions. Uh, do you regret the dissolution of the Soviet Union? And uh, the numbers is always, yes, we regret. In fact, Putin didn't invent anything. He cited public opinion, uh, which was already there. And it moves roughly between 60%. Uh, 50% at the low end, and uh, the last survey in November was 66%. People say we regret that the Soviet Union was dissolved. Uh, but what it actually means when the people say what we actually regret it. And then yeah, if you ask for a follow-up question, why, what you're regretting about the dissolution of the Soviet Union, there's two options there which were dominant and they're actually explaining what's people one it says. The solution of a common economic space, that basically a welfare, so, uh, that's about 60%. Uh, now, uh, and then a second question, we lost the sense of belonging to the great power. Uh, in the last survey, it's only 30%. However, there are times, let's say it in uh, 2012, when the economic situation was much better, it was absolutely the opposite. It was about, uh, was much, about 56% of people thought that the solution of a great power was that. So it's, of course, it's uh, 1914, that's Ukraine situation, annexation of Crimea. Uh, so you have these two kinds of elements 
which drive uh, this nostalgia. One is a belief that the Soviet Union actually was a stable economic situation, which is not stable, especially now when economic situation worsens, uh, actually stagnates and you know, doesn't improve, the real income declines. And somehow merges into that uh, something which a state from above imposes because it cannot reform the economy. If you can't reform the economy, nationalism is a good thing. It says, we lost the great empire. We lost the great empire. And this is two elements which sort of are driving the post-communist nostalgia, which Putin merges. Now, the other thing which is there in the 1990s, there was two kinds of nostalgias the different part of Russian political spectrum uh, encouraged. Uh, the Communist Party, which was a position, encouraged nostalgia for old Soviet Union, while Yeltsin and his uh, branch encouraged nostalgia for pre-imperial Russia. Uh, the famous bureau of Nicholas II, his family in 1998, the state ceremony. Uh, uh, what Putin did, he merged both nostalgias into one, creating something very post-communist. And what he did, he basically took, somehow it remains kind of version of history, which very much remains the Stalinist version of history, where a great achievement of the Russian state is that what's being emphasized. So you look at the Tsarist history, what's they like, it's big wars, generals, empires, and what they take from the Soviet Union, the only part which they can take, which would not give up the legitimacy, is a victory in a great patriotic war, which a cult of that became something which didn't exist in the Soviet history before, to those who don't know, during the Soviet period, there was no military parade until the 60s. And then it was only celebrated as a military parade once every five years, on the round anniversary of the war. The main parade was the November 7th, the day of the revolution. That was the holiday that legitimized the regime. Now the holiday that legitimizes the regime is a military parade on May 9th, which is the parade and the only parade of the Soviet Union to say this was we, that's what we're, fight, we're fighting for. Uh, and it has all kinds of uh, used for anti-Western uh, feelings during the recent years. There's a lot of stickers uh, which I see in Moscow. Some of them are extremely cool, but basically said, we defeated you in a great war. We can repeat. Uh, Asher said, we, can, we screwed you, you know, with a graphic picture of a sex, said, we can repeat. And that means the West. Yeah, we screwed the West. So the war against Nazi Germany somehow metamorphosed into war against the West. Forgetting conveniently the land lease, the Western participation in World War II, because we're talking a great patriotic war in which, of course, the Allies didn't participate. You were talking about the <laughs> merging of two nostalgia under the Putin regime. I wonder whether there is still any space left or there are people or there are groups, social groups or cultural groups which espouse a kind of liberal nostalgia. Is there a place in Russia for liberal nostalgia? For example, the period of great reforms and... I think probably all the people who have a nostalgia for this for liberal period can be probably rounded in the entire room of this. Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, there is an argument, you know, you can have a nostalgia for Russian liberal tradition, you know. Oleg Khordin wrote a book now saying we have a great liberal tradition, going back to princely state of Novgorod with its democracy and all that. Well, but that's intellectual fiction, uh, which I'm personally very sympathetic with, and I think people around this table probably do as well. But as for the public traction, no. But we have to also remember nostalgia is not simply something which comes from below. It's also imposed from above. And- uh, Can liberal nostalgia be imposed from above? Well, uh, the problem is it was never tried. Uh, it was never tried. Yeltsin didn't try, uh, be partly because uh, there is no identity to which, besides the very narrow circles of liberal intelligentsia which would appeal to you. The identity which is cultivated is a great power. We are a great power. Tsarist Soviet is a great power. Red and white were all together. You know, even the title of uh, Putin is Comrade uh, Commander in Chief, uh, Mr. President. Yeah, so combination of red and the white. 
товарищ главнокомандующий, господин президент. So that's what it is. No, there's no, there could be element. You can, if a state would, would be dedicated to a liberal cause, which I don't see, it was, never was dedicated to it in the entire post-communist period. So someone who has kind of like liberal prejudices, I just wonder, so is, is it possible to have a liberal future without a liberal historic memory? What do you think? Why not? Why not? not? I think it's a must. <laughs> so, Look, yes, uh, yeah. you can say one thing uh, in Europe, a uh, country like Spain, which has very little democratic tradition, built a democratic presence without the democratic past and build around, if you look at Central Europe, the first decade of post-communism, not the second decade is more problematic, they invented the past, they invented about the liberal past, were coming back to Europe. And what meant to be coming back to Europe meant to come to liberal Europe. So they invented the liberal tradition where by picking and choosing what they wanted from the national histories, even though most of the national history was not liberal at all. But then you have uh, to name Kaliningrad Airport uh, it's country airport, and that so far hasn't happened. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for this. And uh, for the second round, where all participants comment on it, will uh, will comment on each other. And please, Alexander, if you have a, to add something to what is yeah, this is a great great discussion uh, about nostalgia. I think it was very instructive. But I, I just want to add a few points. Just nostalgia, which is. Uh, which is a sort of rejection of the present in favor of the past, right? So this booms of nostalgia usually signals the dissatisfaction with the present situation. It could be economic dissatisfaction, social, ideological, political, that we don't have Napoleon anymore, you know, that was, we don't have Stalin anymore. So I, I think that this, this Soviet nostalgia or imperial nostalgia, whatever, it means the um, rejection of the current uh, situation. We, we need to understand that. And I, actually, I think it's, it's, it's a good news. Um, another thing is that, uh, like, going back to my idea of um, historical memory as uh, an uh, act uh, in the game of recognition. So, um, uh, reverting to the Soviet past, what uh, does it do, or what would it do for the legitimization of this huge new inequalities between the new rich and the new poor in Russia? There was nothing like that uh, in the Soviet Union. That was exactly the opposite, both on the ideological level, that we're all equal before the law and before the actual you know, salaries and everything, and, and the grocery stores, MTS, they were, but we're equal. And it was, uh, it was, it, it was more or less true. It was more or less real. There, were, there was some corruption. That corruption was nothing in comparison to the current, just nothing. So uh, emphasizing the Soviet past does not do the thing. Uh, emphasizing the imperial past, of course, is very dear, very uh, familiar to in the hands of those who want to legitimize their new, you know, family estates, new policies, new baroque kind of taste. We don't really, you know, neither of us who are here probably have ever been to, have ever visited the new palaces around Moscow or around, you know, in the Urals. What we saw, for instance, was uh, we saw the personal manor, personal, personal, personal palace of Mr. Yanukovych when he fled. Uh, when he had to flee, you know, from his uh, place. And we saw this horrible taste, you know, this golden commodes, these remnants of Habsburg, uh, Barocco, uh, rem remade, you know, with IKEA technologies. Actually, and I think this is what it is. But so the Baroque actual, is not guilty of that. Yeah, I like Baroque. <laughs> you know, Baroque cannot be guilty for what has happened, you know. Would have happened like two centuries later. Baroque is not Baroque guilty, is good, but uh, bad taste, bad taste is about that. And I think bad, bad taste is guilty. But um, so, so the imperial past with serfdom, 
with huge inequalities, you know, with in state systems, a slovenia system in which different parts of the population had different duties and privileges before the law. In such like that were, were different written laws for the different peoples, peasants, uh, gentry. So that is the example to follow. Maybe that I could legitimize this situation. Maybe I could add something because I recently uh, read a book by sociologist Leonid Ionin. <laughs> conservatism update, so he tries to reinvent Russian conservatism or conservative ideology in general. And one of the things that he comes up is actually, he says, well, there is not much left of old conservatism, but what we can maybe uh, try uh, to do is to think about a state system. So a state system is conservative and it's good. So he once was a liberal, and uh, but now he turned conservative, and he suggests a state system. Is it kind of ideology uh, that legitimizes it this is order? Kind of ideology, and saying in the uh, uh, words of people like Nikita Mikhalkov, you know, you, you you can actually hear this literally, you know. But I don't think it is conservative. It was conservative mm -hmm. when it was there in the 19th century Russia before the emancipation. The state, preservation of the state system was a conservative idea. Remaking this huge country according to the state system is not it's is very very radical, almost a utopian idea. So what I would say want to say to summarize is that uh, the Soviet past works as a public display for this fight for recognition for this group that fights for recognition. It is a public display. They show it to the world and to their own people that they come from the Soviet past, they have made their Soviet careers, they practice Soviet lifestyle. Their actual you know, private narratives, which they are very eager to, to share between the peers, between the eagles, between the equals, is the opposite. That's the imperial, the high imperial pre-emancipation Russian past. Thank you. Uh, Pavel. Right. Uh, thanks, everyone. It was really illuminating. And uh, I also wanted to go back to the question of nostalgia. And uh, I think that in terms of liberal nostalgia in particular, I don't think that 1860 is going to be a reference point. Uh, it's rather the 1990s. And uh, we see that there is some nostalgia in Russia today for the 1990s. There was you know, a new museum of the 1990s. Some of it is state-sponsored or sponsored by non-governmental organizations which are relatively close to the Russian state, uh, in particular focused on the legacy of the first president, Boris Yeltsin, um, which is, you know, instrumentalized once again uh, in, in ways which are harmless for the regime. Uh, but I think that it might become at some point uh, a reference for the, you know, if we fantasize about the, uh, as Alexei Navalny says, uh, uh, the beautiful Russia of tomorrow. Um, so in the beautiful Russia of tomorrow, to use his phrase, uh, perhaps in 1990s might be a reference point, perhaps not. But who espouses this nostalgia, nostalgia for the 90s? Because as far as I, I know, in the public discourse, it's, it's treated very negatively. So who are the groups, who are the people who... Right, so, so exactly, it's it's easy generational. So that those people who grew up in the 1990s is those people who got to experience some of the, the positive emancipating sides of uh, the new Russian economy and uh, its global involvement and openness and so on. Uh, all those people who indeed were well off in the 1990s, uh, people from a Russian emerging middle class or indeed, uh, uh, I'm sure that those people who got uh, their money in the 1990s, they also feel... Uh, in some ways pretty nostalgic about the time when they were young and could make millions in a matter of just a few days or perhaps even hours. Um, but I, I do think that uh, it's not the only option. And indeed, uh, you know, we are talking about maybe democratic future, liberal future, um, but uh, it's not necessarily the only option which is available, even after the potential, you know, collapse of Putin's regime. Um, again, to use Navalny as an example, he's recently much more experimenting with a uh, more left-wing uh, ideologist, uh, populist ideologist. And I think he has a point because he sees that populism works around the globe in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, 
since the mid 2000s at least and increasingly so but also in other places as uh, you know i guess lots of you can testify in many countries uh, recently populism wins and uh, um you don't have to come up with a historical memory. Uh, you, you maybe you, you'll have to 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 produce some kind of response, uh, but it's not the prerequisite for gaining but, power. But doesn't this populism actually appeal to the? Uh, doesn't it actually appeal to the past of? Is it is it not this? Uh, is not this populism about making something great again? So it's kind of appeal to history. Yeah, like in in many places. Uh, Certainly, in the, in the in the US, that's uh, that's how it's phrased. Uh, perhaps in many fl- places in Central and Eastern Europe as well, a kind of idea to uh, return to perceived you know traditional roots, maybe to Christian past. In some countries, it's more pronounced than in others. Um, but in, in Russia, I don't think that this populist rhetoric, again, as I said in the first round, I don't think that this populist rhetoric has a historical reference point. Uh, the, the beautiful Russia of tomorrow is not a return to any of the you know, pre-imperial, imperial, or Soviet pasts. It's it's a completely you know it it might emerge as a as a mix of those, uh, and then it might become a selection of one of those pasts. But I think right now uh, it's open, and I think it's it's good for for those who like to um, pr- promote this agenda. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think. Uh, the direction of our discussion is very interesting because we are talking about the state and position of state and nostalgia, which we uh, just put it from from above. But actually, uh, I think we are supposed to talk about society and civil society as well. Because when we are talking about uh, historical memory, we are talking about collective memory. There are a lot of actors who actually uh, take part in its creation. And... uh, Basically, it's very interesting that uh, the uh, idea of a state, the idea of Soslovia, is very popular now in Russia. Actually, it doesn't uh, demand any reform because people just like to identify themselves in, in a state. But in Russia, it was uh, very, um, very interesting, but still understudied tradition of civil society, which started to... Uh, to uh, to develop uh, since the uh, late 18th century and, and was actually very strong uh, during the 19th century. And it is a history of voluntary associations. And if uh, we would look from this perspective on the late 80s, actually it was just unbelievable flourishing of uh, different informal organizations, which actually was voluntary associations. And uh, all the reforms and the idea of civil society, which is supposed to be expanded, and it expanded indeed, uh, in in this context, it was, uh, I think, a search for Russian liberal tradition, and some interesting works were uh, written. Uh, now, uh, at least in the sphere of history, it was an experience of uh, Putin, to establish something like uh, voluntary historical associations, which is the Russian Historical Society and the Russian Military Historical Society, which actually just the branches of the power. But as a reaction, it was created the Free Historical Society. And I think uh, Professor Etkin is able just to talk about its activity because he's a member of this society. And if we uh, just if we look at at the development of uh, society, Russian civil society still exists, and it's uh, probably not that, uh, I don't know, probably its voice is, is not that strong, but there are very interesting development in, inside this society, and I think it, it, it's important to think about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I will start with the last now uh, with civil society, let's not idealize the civil society. Uh, yes, Putin tries to create civil society from above, that's going to fail. Uh, but the civil society is not necessarily liberal. When there's a lot of organizations in Russia, they are extremely anti-liberal in the civil society, and a lot of those organizations were involved directly and indirectly in avoiding Donbass and occupation of Crimea. So let's not equate civil society with liberalism. Uh, 
liberal civil society organization, very anti-liberal civil society organization, and I'm not sure if a panacea would come from either of them. Now, on other thing uh, which Professor Redkin talked about in you there as well, it's an interesting thing that we start talking about the state. And a lot of Russians are now talking, not only Russians, talk about Russia's new, new feudalism. But what stands behind it? What stands behind him in the 1990s was a period of tremendous upward mobility. And if you look at this elite, which now in power, the all very upwardly mobile people came from the bottom of St. Petersburg, mostly social ladder, you know, and climb up. And the taste is according, a cultural taste, like Yanukovych, who was a common thief in Ukraine, you know, was stealing hats from the bathrooms. At least he, thankfully, is not from St. Petersburg. No, he's not. I know that there is poor people people who are from St. Petersburg, and I would not. Uh, uh, but what's happening in Putin's Russia that this social mobility basically stopped. That's, of course, slows, undermines the legitimacy of this regime, and then you have to find the justification for it. And an estate system is a perfect way to justify it. This is a stable social order, and we have to accept it. In fact, there's a lot of things going on there, kind of, Idealization now, Brezhnev period has begun to be idealized. Why? Because of its stability. Stability becomes in this, when authoritarian rulers rule for a long time, they admire stability in trying to justify it. And I'm talking about the states in your feudalism and all that. It's a perfect ploy to do it. So, uh, uh, but which, and uh, over a long period of time, these regimes would be in crisis because you cannot go up. You know, social mobility is completely closed. The university system becomes more and more elitist. Uh, most of the best institutions of higher education are de facto private. You have to pay University of Moscow and some of the elite school up to $10,000 a year to study in an income of several hundred dollars a year, uh, a month. Uh, so, and that's how you completely shut down upward mobility. The other issue I want to address, and this is kind of nostalgia from the 1990s. The regime, of course, wants to legitimize 1990s. It called Lihi Divinosti, which would be translation, wild or evil 1990s. Well, it's all Soviet in practice, you know, you did try to legitimize the regime which came before you. Uh, that's what Khrushchev did to Stalin, that's what Brezhnev did uh, uh, to Khrushchev, and that's what Gorbachev, the story, did uh, to Brezhnev. Uh, uh, and of course, with a lot of interesting, there was a conference of American Slavicists where the strategies of legitimation of a regime by completely blackening the the democratic or quasi-democratic experience of the 1990s, they have to legitimize. And therefore, the alternative narrative is precisely this. To say the, the 1990s were not as bad, there's a period of freedom, uh, uh, and there are some places which are dedicated for it. So if, you know, come back to what we said earlier, you know, if, if some point in the future, the way Khrushchev reforms became popular again in the 1980s, you know, when the next wave of reform will come, and it will come at some point, you know, we don't know when, uh, the 1990s and late 80s, basically 1990s, we really start in 1989 and going to probably for the first part of the 90s, uh, would be another model of freedom. You know, this was a freedom. Uh, one thing that Professor Atkin talked is about, again, opening the social gaps, and this is a very problematic uh, to the legitimacy of the regime, uh, because actual Russian citizens in all surveys consistently over all the post-communist period said, Russian citizens still have very egalitarian notions, uh, and therefore the, the gap between people's acceptance of inequality, in actual inequality is, is growing high, and at some point it would be intolerable by the regime. Thank you very much. much. And now perhaps someone from the audience, there was a gentleman there on the back, and uh, yes, please, just introduce yourself. Right. <coughs> right. Uh, my name is Dmitry Skrovsky. I'm probably one of the very recent people who made an idea only two and a half years ago. In my previous life, I was a full-time professor and media historian in the Euro Federal University in the city of Yekaterinburg, uh, pursuing for 30 years the history of uh, Russian and Soviet media. 
What actually made me very confused uh, listening to our discussion, to your round table, that very often when we spoke about different definitions, we didn't precisely refer to the idea of what we mean by that. We started from the point of the Soviet or Russian elite, and I was very, very frustrated because I didn't understand at all what it means. Probably, in your connotation, it meant that it concerns a political sphere which regulates the relationship in the country, but at the same time, my initial question is, who is listening now to the political sphere? Except uh, television presenters and some, a few people, but the audience who I was very much in touch because about a month ago I was again in the motherland and talked to the students about what they actually feel, what I do feel at the moment. The idea of the political elite is extremely, extremely disturbed. Another point, when we talk about nostalgia, what actually we refer to? Where are the opinion polls about nostalgia? Because I used to see a lot of different opinion polls, but frankly speaking, I don't believe them at all. Because all of them, I mean, from Levada Center and many others are bought off by the government. Thank what you. can be oriented on? What particular uh, nostalgia it is? Pre-Soviet, after-Soviet, post-Soviet? How can I believe it? I'm a media historical. This is definitely different to what you were talking about. But I think that we should be a slightly more exact about what we mean by different definition, which makes a discussion more productive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And perhaps I'll ask Alexander to answer about elites and then it's talk about uh, nostalgia. Elites, what are the elites? Well, elite is a confusing uh, term, uh, and I agree with that. Uh, but uh, there is no, no, no doubt that there are you know, p powerful people in any society. In more equal society, this, the number of these powerful people are uh, larger. In a less equal society, the elite is very narrow. Uh, it's not only political elite. And in the contemporary Russia, the, we see the really confluence or merging of different or maybe all types of elite. You know, law enforcement uh, people, uh, financial people, uh, PR people. Is there um, a place in it for cultural elite? Is there any cultural elite in Russia today? In Putin? There is, I think. Uh, but it is also increasingly narrow, increasingly uh, rich and increasingly, increasingly special. It is so special that probably you would not recognize it as a cultural elite at all. For example, like give us examples. Well, like, I, I, I mean, whom to socialize? Get a Michal coffee, you know, the kind of co 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 coffee table uh, name. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, talk, please, about what is nostalgia, actually, and how do we know that these perhaps people are lying to the service. Maybe it's an authoritarian regime. People don't trust this regime. Do they lie? Uh, let me uh, first uh, address the first part. Uh, what is elites? Well, there is a clear definition what elites are. And one thing about Russia, that business and political elites are very much together. You can't be in Russia a billionaire without regime agreeing to you being a billionaire. And if you want to disagree, you, you chill yourself in a couple of years in Siberia, as, as Khodorkovsky did. Uh, that's one. So, you know, so you cannot be a, a Western type economic elite which can ignore what politicians are doing in Russia. The higher you are, the more you're dependent on good graces of a political elite, which proved in a confrontation with Khodorkovsky that in Russia, ultimately, Politics matters more than economics. And uh, you, in the money you made, or where you made it, doesn't matter. You can be completely uh, disowned. And the new economic elite mostly owes its capital to, to the fact that the Putin crony is uh, personal friends. Now, what's nostalgia and what it is? Now, we can disagree about service. I trust Levada, you don't, and I don't think it would be, I think I know how they work, I mean, I know these people, and say I don't trust, they're all bought up by this or others. Uh, I'm not sure that Levada was bought up by the Kremlin, they tried to close it down, so, uh, and they barely survived, so I don't, 
but we can disagree. Uh, what's for nostalgia, I think it was very clear what they said, was uh, people regret strongly that Soviet Union disintegrated. Uh, if you look at the political parties and the regimes, which uses that when you see Russian leaders, they sit in the office behind them, is a map of the Soviet Union. Not a map of Russian Federation, map of the Soviet Union, unabashedly map of the Soviet Union. Uh, where you ask, uh, and it's true, we can argue to what degree it's going from below, to what degree, but there is a strong sense that there was something good and it disappeared. And it's true, as Alexander said, that it's usually nostalgia says that the present is not satisfactory. In fact, usually it's a time in a time of turmoil when the past is idealized. And uh, here we have an interesting thing. It's, it looks like a time of stability in the past is being idealized. So, but uh, we're talking about particular feelings toward the past, and it's a past which is alive. It's alive and it distorted. You know, when people ask, when people ask, if you look at follow-up questions, what you like in the Soviet Union, we like a stability uh, of the com economy. Well, we forget the lines, we forget the shortages, we forget a lot of things. It's an invented past, but never mind. They eager for that because prices were low. Vodka cost the ruble eighty, uh, and not whatever it's cost now. Uh, basic staples were cheap and and available. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, could you just introduce yourself? Silvia uh, Stern. I'm a newly received PhD in the economic history of late imperial Russia. It seems to me, listening to uh, all your presentations, it seems to me that I have a, a piece in the puzzle to contribute. That is, the Russian economy traditionally is a dual sector economy where the geopolitical uh, imperatives created a very modern military industrial complex that lives, thrives on sacrifices made in the civilian economy. And this structure could proliferate under non-pecuniary incentive system, that is, the supply of labor and skill on ideology for better future, for tomorrow. This work during the Soviet period, uh, right, especially right after the victory in Second World War, the farther away, the weaker, the <coughs> non pecuniary incentive structure and the Soviet Union, actually the productivity fell down from the 17th, it collapsed. Now, it, there was a period of privatization that it had been hoped that privatization, same as the living land reform, to bring about the supply skill of labor upon economic individual incentives. But what need, had been needed, this was a change in the physical branch structure, in the physical production structure. <laughs> and that uh, implied a full democratization process, that is the full respect of individual property rights and um, a very stable <coughs> taxation system. And this actually never materialized. This is the Yeltsin era. Yes, there were oligarchs and so on, but the productive accumulation of capital had been thwarted. And this is also a traditional method. So actually, this non, that is the pecuniary incentive structure could not work. So there is a need for revival and legitimization of the uh, imperial or, or the Soviet ethos in order to be able to, to uh, 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 let me say, incentivize people to produce in spite of the fact that the economic incentives still for the majority of the population are not stable. Uh, thank you very much. And perhaps in this respect, I could uh, follow it as a kind of question, and it's a kind of tricky question, uh, is about relationship between property and memory. Because we have now new property, but there was the old property before revolution, which is, was illegally confiscated. Is there any talk in Russia at all about some kind of restoration of property? You know, the, uh, restitution. Re restitu yeah, restitution of property. Because we uh, speak a lot in respect of Eastern Europe. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what about uh, restitution of property or uh, symbolic, not symbolic in, uh, in Russia? Is it a real option? Well, 
one. Um, yeah, thanks. I think it's not so much the case with the individual owners of private, you know, property factories or whatever, but it's very much the case with the Russian Orthodox Church recently. And a lot of properties, you know, churches uh, turned clubs, uh, factories, uh, swimming pools, whatever, under the Soviet regime are now being transferred back to the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, and this is also an important element. And this is also a particular you might say, type of memory or historical tradition, uh, including parts of uh, memory which are neither Soviet nor imperial, but rather uh, Russian emigre past of the 20th century, that the Russian government also uses skillfully, and uh, some of it is uh, uh, legitimized and uh, introduced to the canon of uh, historical memory. I think it has this very significant economical element. It's it's a lot about property and land plots and buildings and so on. But I don't think so much about individual owners. I don't think it's the case. Thank you. And Isabel, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Isabella Gino from Truman Institute, Hebrew University. I would like to bring up another player that is no less important than uh, uh, the number that you mentioned here. And it is a law against falsification of. Uh, Russian history detrimental to the Russian interests. It was accepted by Putin, in, I think, in 2000, uh, 2014. Since then, uh, some people were arrested, some people were thrown out of their jobs, and uh, um, it, at least for uh, for us in our uh, war that we finished in uh, 2017. It was very important uh, um, block because people who in this, this historical uh, memory, people who were <coughs> prepared to speak to us openly on the phone uh, were sending us to their uh, um, commandeers, uh, their, their uh, highest. Uh, Levels uh, to obtain the us to uh, we had to obtain the, um, uh, of, uh, their uh, permission to speak, and of course uh, we even didn't try it, and no one no one of you mentioned it. The law because this is very important. Really, it was used not once and not twice in the last years. Thank you very much. I mean, um, yeah, I can also. Sure. Well, uh, the law you're talking about is 2010 law. Uh, and even committee was created. It was a time. Well, committee was created before it was. Uh, the law was from 2010. Uh, committee was created again. This was a debate. Alexander would talk more about it, about World War II memory and how we're commemorating World War II because Central Europeans in the boats have and Ukrainians mm -hmm. have a very different memory. Of World War II, uh, Israel was dragged into this because we also have part of a memory of World War II. It's slightly different. The committee was established. We produced a couple of uh, volumes of documents, and like all often happened in Russia, it died. Uh, inglorious death, uh, as, you know, reminds me of Karamzin, famous expression, but uh, Volnik mitigation of cruelty of Russian laws, it's their non-fulfillment. Uh, so, uh, so that's sort of, uh, it became a part of his memory wars, which still continues in our most recent iteration of that, was a debate about the Panfilov's uh, heroes, which uh, turn out that famous Panfilov stories, which a lot of Russian and Israelis left was uh, brought upon, was a fake. It didn't, it didn't exist. The battle didn't take place. And when the Russian Minister of Culture, uh, which could be, you know, compared to our current Israeli Minister of Culture, yeah. uh, said that doesn't matter what's actually happened. You don't destroy national myths. And dismissed the head of Russian archival service who brought up the story, which it never happened. Uh, so the part of that goes back to 2010, uh, Professor... 
Alexander had a whole project of Russian historical memory, can talk more, uh, but uh, the memory wars didn't end. They continue uh, the various holidays which are not celebrated, uh, which exist, which talk about, which never materialize whether Russia should move its Independence Day from June 12th to some other unclear date which yet to be <laughs> decided upon, uh, the, you know, what's to do with uh, Revolution Day, uh, November 7th, what, in its various, uh, so that continues, but I don't know of anybody who actually was arrested and put in jail uh, as a violation of 2010 law, maybe Alexander would correct. Uh, no, th there, is, uh, there are two sides to this question. One is that particular c committee and uh, whatever, whatever it was, a st statement by of the, I think, of this uh, governmental committee. I, I also don't know, don't know anybody who was arrested on that grounds, but, uh, but there are historians and hugely important historians such as Yuri Dmitriev, who excavated uh, the uh, uh, site of mass murder uh, in Karelia who has been arrested for fake uh, se sex-related crime, which he didn't commit. Uh, and he has been in jail under investigation, I think, for the second year. But uh, <clears throat> the good news about this, this is that even though there is a clear intention and vicious intention of the authorities to, to, to incarcerate this particular historian, they could not use that law, that committee, or that that formula of the uh, whatever fake uh, historical um, narrative. So they had to invent an entirely un unrelated uh, legal uh, narrative in order to in order to make harm to this person. Uh, but um, I may add to this that there is a continuation to the story because the second person was arrested on fake sex-related crimes. So the question of, uh, like, it looks like, I don't know if it's, uh, the initiative comes from the center or from the local authorities, but it looks like it's a very concerted effort to suppress this memory, and it's a very important site at, at Sandermoch. Uh, so, um, and if the judge, it's not clear what's better, if you are actually judge according to the law, even if the law is unjust, or if you, um, if, if there is a kind of logic of terror, which is applied randomly. You can't know when and what charges you will be arrested. So uh, what is more, in a sense, dangerous than... Uh... Also a logic of a, a powerful group of people who use all, any or all tools, you know, according to their will, arbitrarily. But they have many. And they, you know, they make random choices. Um, yes, please. Uh, the kind of question we were talking Just before, this, 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 we were talking before about nostalgia and uh, history as something that Russians can kind of or have to kind of pick and choose, not something that belongs to them, <coughs> and and they uh, they choose according to their taste or according to their interests, and uh, I know it's a it's a Russian thing to choose. Uh, which is the past, uh, to the present, and... Uh, no, well, no one has ever done it in the no, past, except the general, the I think there's always discussion about uh, which past they won, right? Because they lost the, the Renaissance Revolution and all that. And uh, I wanted to ask if uh, between the communist past and the imperial past, do the Russian people of today have any other choices? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. As being historical subjects, I mean, it's uh, this kind of. Uh, well, there are, there are, I mean, you know, there are all kinds of cult people, cult, cults uh, in Russia, you know, people who they cherish uh, uh, the pre imperial past. There are, you know, paganists. There, there are different sex, sex and religions and, uh, and cults. Uh, but uh, I think to talking about Russian society in general, we have only two options, frankly. My question was, what do you view as a Russian? How? Just uh, because I also wanted to... Okay. Uh, yes, at least uh, in the sphere of uh, teaching of history, and the attempt was uh, uh, to introduce a new concept, the concept of Russian civilization, which means that there are some eternal values 
which it doesn't matter was it imperial or communist or post-communist, it's a huge country which needs a strong leader, uh, the solidarity of Russian people is the eternal value, and uh, actually a kind of abhinni, tenacity, community, and all the values of uh, uh, communal uh, social behavior. Uh, and if we are talking about nostalgia, actually one strong element of the, this uh, nostalgia of the Soviet period is the nostalgia of solidarity. When everybody were brothers, when everybody helped each other and uh, go the common places, actually, uh, the, the communal flats, which is just, uh, just a nightmare. <laughs> I just remember <laughs> as a child. Uh, but actually, it's idealization of certain things. And the point of civilization uh, just helps to explain all these things. And actually, there is no need for development. There is no need for future, for question about what is going to be tomorrow, because the, the main thing is yesterday, not tomorrow. Uh, just uh, one color, a, a, a clarification question. Mm -hmm. Was it uh, was there really social solidarity in the Soviet period, or was it an atomistic society? Is it kind of invented imagination of um, in my solidarity? Opinion, it is uh, it's completely invented. It's it's uh, imagined tradition which was created in in early twentieth. Uh, uh, one century, because in nineties everybody just talk about very different things and uh, uh, lack of social mobility and stratification and, and atomization of society, and this kind of nostalgia is, uh, I think, is much more characteristic for younger people who actually uh, have no experience of real Soviet life. The Pavel probably would tell better. <laughs> um, I mean, I actually wanted to propose that there is yet another version of historical memory or society uh, that might become relevant in the future, precisely post-Soviet, right? That what is present today will become the past in just a matter of 10, 15, 20 years. And the events of today, you know, there's going to be a reassessment of Putin's regime. And, uh, you know, after the you know, revolution, transition of power, whatever, the emergence of the new regime, democratic elections, whatever is going to happen, uh, there are going to be new heroes created. You know, there might be heroes who were at Bolotne, uh, you know, who fought with the police on the streets uh, last year. Um, doesn't really, you know, we, we, we don't really know, but there is a reservoir of uh, events, heroes, interpretations from the 90s, 2000s, and uh, indeed the recent, most recent decade. Uh, maybe I will just try to be provocative, sure. uh, and uh, sure. who knows who will revaluate re uh, Putin? Maybe it will be the regime of terror who will revaluate re uh, re him. So, how can we sure that the transition will be to that direction? No, not, not necessarily. War heroes, for instance. Yeah, yeah, but, but uh, what I'm saying is that there are lots of figures from this regime. You know, there might be someone who fought in Donbass in 2014, for example. Uh, but uh, there is uh, potential for this period also to become important and uh, instrumental in the creation of new historical memory, which is going to be neither imperial nor Soviet, but indeed you know, based on the reassessment of the post-Soviet period. Yeah. Uh, Alex, please. The history department for Hebrew University. Uh, I have a specific question towards Stalin. How is his memory faring right now? Uh, uh, Putin, for what I heard, it is, uh, has been expressing himself very carefully on this subject. He said, on the one hand, we will never condone uh, uh, cruelties and repressions, but on the other hand, of course, we have to remember his positive blah, blah. So, so he's he was he's trying to be balanced. On the other hand, I hear there is rampant. They tell me, people tell me that in various places there is really ramp, rampant open re-Stalinization. Uh, is it true? Is there a, a, what is happening in the government and also in the various public forces, uh, uh, including political parties, even the Communist Party? Is the Russian Communist Party now openly 100% Stalinist? Have they abolished the 20th uh, Congress resolutions and they concerned about it? Okay. Well, it's, uh, you know, there are many, many answers to your question. You know, there is a very direct question. Uh, because there is everything. Starting from Putin, he, he is balanced, the Communist Party is balanced in, in its own way, but it is very much pro-Stalinist. But um, if you just go to a bookstore in Moscow or Petersburg, you will be amazed. And it really comes from, to, to large, it comes from the bottom. 
you have you know big 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 shelves full of books about Stalin all kinds of biographies mostly mostly fake but very eloquent thick and uh, commercially successful and there are dozens and dozens positive. of them positive yeah balanced <laughs> uh, a couple of answers to you Alex uh, Russian Communist Party is of course combines two things. It combines on one hand admiration of Stalin, by working with Stalin's pictures and the Russian Orthodox Church at the same time, which is a contradiction in terms. And a, a colleague of mine, Wojko Vyacic from European University in St. Petersburg, called Russian Communist Party, not Communist Party, but National, National Socialist Party, which it really is. Uh, you know, it's kind of combination where even icons, uh, some of his weird ch church figures have icons of Stalin, you know, real Orthodox icons of Stalin. Now, the question is popular. Two questions are one is a popularity, and it's uh, and it's in the thirties. Depends when you ask in pop. But that what it really means, and that is more important question. When they say when we like Stalin, when people twenty years old, or thirty years old, or forty years old, think about it. Stalin died in nineteen fifty three. So uh, people who remembered Stalin's past well in the eighties, to put it mildly. Uh, to whom it was a living experience. So to the rest, it's not a living experience. It's experience from their parents, grandparents, books. Uh, and here, the opinion is divided. You know, to some of them, it's a symbol of a strong state. Russia comes up with its knees. Uh, this is somebody who ter to whom is this to some, to some people, it's a symbol of anti-liberalism, of over-reforms, uh, of one big... So there's many things, and that part is not fully studied. <coughs> what Stalinism, when a 20 years old members of a Communist Party, carrying Stalin, what it means to them. It's Stalin stopped being Stalin, in a sense that it became something else. It became history of concept, you know, it's a concept now. Stalin, Stalinism, a concept where everybody can assign anything uh, that they want. Uh, from a Russian Communist Party, which is able to combine a love of Orthodox Church and pictures of Stalin uh, to everything else. So we don't have a full picture of what cult of Stalin really means to Russians who are not 85 plus. We should add also the cult of Ivan the Terrible. That's... Yeah. That is, but it's less of popularity than uh, <coughs> yes, to say on. Anyone else? Uh, Michael, please. Um, Michael Kirchner from Columbia University. Um, there's something fundamental I'm puzzled about, and it, it comes to some of the things that were said before. If you look at national memory, <coughs> nation building in general, it's because we need people either to pay taxes, or to fight, or to work. And while my grasp of the threat of Russian things is not so great, it's not clear to me that the Putin regime really needs mass participation in any of those things. The economy rests on petroleum. The army, all contemporary armies are very small by modern standards, including the Russian army. And uh, it doesn't tax ordinary people. So what does it need? What does it expect from the project of nation building? And how much nation building and production of national memory should we expect if those three things really aren't so necessary in Russia as they might have been in 1946? Yeah, that's a great statement. Even, even though I think it, it's a little bit exaggerated because say Russian army, you know, still there is, you know, it is mandatory uh, and it, it, uh, it's very kind of old fashioned uh, army. Um, you, it, um, but uh, th there is another response to this. So the, it, indeed, economically, definitely, Putin's regime doesn't need mass participation. But uh, th there was a key moment in 2012 in which Putin's regime failed the power of people's protest. It didn't come even close to the revolution, but it was a powerful protest in the capital of Russia, which you know, shook the fundamentals of the regime. And everything that, 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 that followed was directed towards the avoidance of the mass protest, not so much towards the mass participation, like involvement. Of, it's, it's not like full factor, but more like push factor. Well, so basically, yes, I wanted to reiterate what Professor Elkin just said, but perhaps there is also a longer history to this 
uh, we might remember Russian, in particular Putin's responses to Ukrainian revolution, you know, as as uh, early as 2004, and uh, clear, uh, dis- uh, you know, the idea that he wanted to dismiss the uh, uh, very thought of something like this happening in Russia. So, you know, t- t- uh, 2012 was a significant event, but I think even you know a decade before that. Uh, with all the color revolutions in many post-Soviet countries, that's something that they want to prevent happening in Russia. Uh, Michael, question is great. Uh, why Russia does need its citizens? Yeah. Uh, what it needs for? But let's put it this way: uh, oil and gas is not everything. Uh, it's a big state, and actually oil prices and gas prices decline. So just was trying to figure out what's the percentage of taxes uh, Russian citizens pay uh, as a percentage of GDP. I don't have a number, but I'll find it for you. Uh, they have a flat tax. They pay. Uh, it's some number. If I'm not mistaken, oil and gas is about 60% of a budget, so 40% is still it's not Saudi Arabia, you know, or Qatar, or, or that kind of a country. But you write about one thing. It's a state which wanted, after communism, to demobilize its citizens. It doesn't need. So what is a state building means? It's a great question, what a state building means. I'm not sure if the Russian regime knows what state building means, besides the fact that we can issue an order in Moscow in hope hope that it's going to be executed in Vladivostok, you know, because there is no assurance it's going to be executed. And we know that most of these orders are not, because if you look at presidential decrees and the list of them, some of them are repeating themselves. That means the previous decrees were not uh, being executed. So uh, its understanding of a state building is very primitive. A state building means that I can intimidate you into doing what I want you to do. Uh, Besides that, we want to be a great power internationally, whatever it takes to do so. You know, for that, we need a state which citizens will do whatever we want. But I don't think they have a strategy of nation building. I don't think they have a strategy of state building. You know, they have a kind of thing. A lot of that is kind of symbolic. So Crimea is a symbolic thing. You know, Crimea, Russia doesn't need Crimea. Economically, it's a pit. Uh, it's highly subsidized place. It doesn't get water uh, from anywhere. Uh, so why you need it? You need it for symbolic figures. So there's a lot of symbolic state building and very little actual one besides the power of intimidation. Yeah. Uh, I think the creation of national memory is it's not only the issue of the state, because national identification is a very important part of the personal identification. And uh, actually, uh, what does it mean to, to feel Russian now? It's a huge question. A uh, very interesting doctoral dissertation was finalized uh, just two months ago <coughs> um, in Tel Aviv University. It's about uh, contemporary Russian nationalism, and it is one of issues of this dissertation. Thank you. Okay. I'll collect two more questions, and then uh, yeah, uh, you and you. Let yeah. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Lisa Frankel. I'm an MA student in Ben Gurion University. <coughs> And thank you very much for your presentation. I writing my thesis uh, after actually your book, Alexander Etkin. Uh, my thesis, like you inspired me to write uh, about how people are remembered today, the Stalin terror. So my focus in Pasadena Adis and uh, all this, um, 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 like what they're doing, how they're doing, and etc. Uh, etc. Et so my question will be maybe uh, not as an historian, maybe more than anthropologist. So. Uh, why people are interested today in this difficult past? Who are interested in this difficult past? How this past is transmitted? It's a biographical thing. How people are telling this to each other? And how actually people are uh, formulate this counter-memory um, narrative while we know and like how, how the government tried to impose it uh, on people? Like what are the grassroots are doing? Um, and uh, there, yes, yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Ken Bola from Truman Institute. My question is, uh, what is the place of the, um, let's say, the periphery, especially the Caucasus, Kafkaz, in the construction of, of current uh, memory, um, taken into account that from at least some historical perspective, 
this can be well well Zakafkazia trans Caucasus can be an area that uh, has uh, post colonized you know, Caucasus from some perspectives is an area which is still colonized but of course not from the Russian perspective what is the place of this in, in, in the construction of, of uh, memory and so, yeah, two, two great questions. I, I will be brief. I will be brief. Um, so there, there is, of course, a clear. To the, starting from the first question, there is a, a you know, in, 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 in a quick response that probably this uh, those people who are working on the counter narrative they are mostly the descendants of the victims of the terror. But empirically speaking, it is not true. And the way to, to look at it is to go to the Memorial Society in Moscow and in Petersburg. In Petersburg, by the way, the local authorities have just yesterday kicked out the Memorial Society from its place, like where the archives were and everything, you know. And people actually, the, the actual descendants of the victims came, you know, to gather and uh, share their experiences. Anyway, but th this is probably not true because many of this, I call these people enthusiasts of memory. They come from random families. Some of them are descendants of the victims. Many of them are just, you know, regular Moscovites or, you know, dwellers of different Russian provinces where there were camps or sites of mass murder. Um, and some of them uh, actually believe that they were they 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 are descendants of the perpetrators. So it's uh, I th and I think kind of from a humanist perspective, actually, it's a uh, better view on you know to just to imagine these people as just you know general sample of the population okay now about the caucuses probably there are people who are much more competent in this audience that i am but uh, i believe that the, the the historical narratives are entirely different and they do not truly communicate the local narratives in the caucuses and there are many you know, depending on the area or the people or the language and the uh, uh, hegemonic Russian narrative, they do not truly communicate. And that's, of course, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, just briefly, maybe to give you another example, um, on, on this, on Pasadena address, on the last address campaign, right, which commemorates the last address where uh, those who were victims of political repression uh, used to live before uh, going to the gulags and never getting back, right? Um, I, there was a guy in Moscow called Pavel Gnilarybov uh, who, who has this uh, project of guided tours, Mospeshkom. And, you know, he, he has an Instagram account. He has a very active social media presence. And he's been, I think, quite influential in getting this anti-Stalinist message across and also showing the people the addresses of... Uh, the victims of political repression. He has a very strange hybrid identity. I think he was a hipster libertarian eight years ago. He now embraced a new kind of Cossack identity because his uh, um, I don't know, grandparents were apparently Cossacks and they were uh, decolocalized in uh, 1930 or something. So you can, you know, even in this kind of individual family histories, um, you can come with a very strange mix of past and backgrounds. And it's ultimately, I guess, that's the way it is in many Russian families. Then there is no coherent version of you know, family memory uh, that you have to, again, selectively choose, you know, who I am, where do I come from, uh, how do I position myself in terms of, uh, you know, Stalinism uh, or 1917 uh, or pre-imperial past. Uh, so... You know, it, it can be very hybrid, and in the sense that you know, it is anti-Stalinist. Uh, even though, uh, as far as I understand, he's not really uh, motivated by these uh, familial connections. But he's you know quite successful employing uh, contemporary media technologies and so on. Uh, I will start with a, with a question about focuses, uh, and here Alexander is absolutely right. It's two narratives, but one has to, if you increase that kind of thing, think about counter narratives in entire Russia with Tatars and others. After all, we're talking about a multi-ethnic state with a complicated ethnic dimension to its history. In 1990s, when it was more or less a fair, there's a lot of counter narratives were written. 
uh, and then in the, in the 2000s in the centralizing uh, Putin, uh, Putin regimes started cracking down on this alternative narrative of Russian history and you occasionally we know about historians who have been dismissed books which were uh, not published by books are published in local languages so uh, so in that's currently my understanding is in sort of a there's an element of uh, you know fear of censorship, especially on the local level. But it will come back. So a lot of things were written in the 1990s, uh, which will come back, and occasionally these things come up uh, to the fore. Uh, uh, Sochi Olympics, when it started, suddenly the ethnic diaspora uh, remind the or uh, remind that Sochi is actually is out of Russian colonization and the genocide of a Caucasian people, and we shouldn't celebrate so much the place uh, as it was, and then it sums up, comes up. Now, on the first question about, I don't know exactly who this, besides the particular cultural agents of memory, but it's interesting, it's, a, it's a not exactly a program of Russia only, uh, I learned uh, recently from a relative in Lithuania that they have a very similar project, a last address of a Jewish family. So they go to the buildings and say, do you know your Jewish neighbors who lived there before 1941? I want to put a memorial plaque there. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you go, I was with someone in Amsterdam, if you go to Amsterdam and you see plaques in the buildings, in these buildings, from these buildings, this and these families were deported. So it's kind of, it looked like a global memory project of a last address. And in any case, they are kind of local agents of change. And I don't know, I'm not anthropologist. Exactly, you're right. This anthropologist project. And in Stolpestein in Germany, yeah. there are lots yeah, of... Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And I will ask the participants the, uh, the last question, which is, um, what uh, will be the historical memory of the Russians within 20 years. Your bet. <laughs> well, my bet that during this coming 20 years, <clears throat> there will be so many, so dramatic, so life-changing events that the memory will be most about these events that we don't know about. <laughs> But um, yes, and, and to reiterate that once again, what happened during the first two decades of the 21st century is also going to be important. It's going to be reevaluated. And there may be lots of events that we do not really notice today, that we do not know today about today, uh, that are going to become important in the new you know, mythologies of the you know, 2040s or something. Thank you. I have a short question, which actually I don't know, but the longer, uh, the, lo the short answer, the, the longer answer is that uh, the most uh, sophisticated period of the recent past is 90s, and there are different attitudes to this period, so I guess that then it will be a kind of uh, past, more distant past, probably new discussion about 90s as a period of uh, you know, wild period or period of uh, Liberty, probably it will it will be the main issue of the discussion. Yes, I would like to remind you of the Talmudic saying, you know, that after destruction of a temple, the power of a prophecy belongs to the idiots. Uh, so I think we should all hear in some sort of a capacity of that. Uh, and I want to, you know, Putin regime is one of the longest regimes, continuous regimes in uh, Russian history. You know, longer than Brezhnev now. And it itself would be at some point, you know, if Putin thinks like Stalin, he lived forever, and if he goes and spends hours in gym and swimming pool, it would increase his life expectancy. Uh, but uh, somehow, you know, statistics here is 100% right. He never lived beyond certain age. Uh, and beyond that, there's nothing. There's no institutions. He destroyed everything. So I think one of the subjects of uh, in 20 or 30 years would be, A, how we got to that, and B, why it lasted so long, and why and how it's ended. Thank you very much. And I, uh, let me thank all of you for coming here and our participants for this wonderful debate. And uh, hopefully we'll have another occasion to continue our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.